I'm very pleased to welcome uh, on board Chris Larson, who is working for Red Panda, uh, to talking about Red Panda Streaming Data Platform. Hi. Well, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, my name is Chris Larson. I am a, um, a, a right now I'm a director of strategic partnerships at Red Panda. Um, I've been in that role only for the past uh, month or two. And prior to that, I've been in field engineering, working with our customers uh, for approximately one year. Um, and prior to that, I was at Confluent for a few years. So I've been in the event streaming space <clears throat> for quite a while. And um, I'm really pleased to be able to show you how you can get up and running very quickly <clears throat> with a, a streaming data platform using Red Panda. Um, we, we do really well to um, you know, make it very easy to stand up a cluster and get a Kafka API going uh, and, and you get an additional benefits as well. So without further ado, I will get started here. So I'm gonna talk today about uh, you know, who is Red Panda? Why would you Red Panda? Um, and then uh, a little bit about how you get started with Red Panda in a day, right? So uh, very quick and easy to run us in the cloud. Uh, we have a number of different modes to run on your laptop, just such as Docker. Um, and then we have a couple different modes of running Red Panda and Kubernetes and VM and bare metal as well. So um, Red Panda was created uh, a few years ago, approximately you know four or five years ago now at this point, and um, Alex Gallego is our founder. He um, created Red Panda because he was working heavily with Kafka when his company was acquired and brought into Akamai. Um, he was working on high performance storage platforms and realized that the complexity uh, that you get out of Kafka and the performance that you don't tend to get from Kafka was um, challenging for him to see and work with. So he thought, hey, I could probably do really well by uh, implementing a high performance storage related uh, you know, event streaming platform. And, uh, and, and there it was, right? So it's, it's, it's really a next generation Kafka platform he, uh, well, we, we were created in San Francisco. Um, we're currently a Series B and we're funded by Google Ventures and Lightspeed. And you can see just some of the customers that we have. Uh, a number of these are public references and the vast majority of these are actually in production today. Um, this is actually even a, a little bit dated slide that, uh, you know, we, we certainly have some even bigger names uh, than, than some of these here. So we've been around. So our reason for being um, is really to take advantage of the modern hardware that's out there. So when Kafka was created, uh, it was it, it was centered around the Hadoop era, right? Where you had uh, JVMs, uh, you're using general purpose commodity hardware, uh, and you know disk storage was still you know relatively. Um, relatively expensive and you didn't really get that great a performance out of it. So now you get these SSDs that um, give you really good performance. And uh, of course you can get large VMs as well with a lot of cores and better networking. So why not have a high performance uh, data streaming platform that can take advantage of these things and give you uh, better performance, be more scalable, um, you know, operate in a more simple fashion and be more durable, actually. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So we like to think of ourselves as next generation Kafka. Um, we're really striving for, you know, simplicity, which is how we go beyond Pulsar, in our opinion, um, and, uh, and, and still provide a Kafka API, full compatibility of your Kafka API. So along simple lines, um, we are Kafka API compatible. There are very few uh, APIs that, uh, that, are, that are not implemented. One of them actually is follower fetching that we're actually in beta as of today. So if you're interested in doing like multi-region stretch clusters, for example, or wanting to save money on your uh, multi-AZ deployments, um, definitely reach out and we can help get you started on a beta for follower fetching. 
but otherwise, um, the vast majority of, of the, the APIs are there because we essentially are a Kafka. Uh, we rebuilt Kafka from the ground up, right? So um, it's, it's very easy for us to do code generation for the API calls, for example. Um, and that's how we know that we're complete in our API spec. We are single binary. So that means that you can actually uh, get these additional components wrapped into your one binary. Um, these additional components include the consensus platform, which is Raft. So we are Raft throughout. Um, HTTP proxy, which we call Panda proxy, and a schema registry. So when you stand up Red Panda, um, those things are just available to you by default. You don't have to stand up additional pieces. Um, and then also we are Raft um, throughout, like I said, so it's you know that the data replication actually is happening in Raft. Uh, so you don't actually have to think about two different fault domains like a Zookeeper or a KRAFT cluster. Um, and then we do have continuous data balancing, so you don't have to have a separate cluster for um, or a separate you know component for cruise control, for example. Um, and then our centralized config makes it makes it so much easier. You just like. Uh, send an API command into any one of the brokers, and um, it will actually replicate that config to all of the brokers. And then we have built-in observability. So when you have your API uh, admin API endpoint stood up, uh, which is just there by default, actually, you'll get a Prometheus uh, scrapable endpoint. So um, you can just like scrape that with any Prometheus tool or Prometheus itself. And then we have uh, six different Grafana dashboards. So you don't have to have these you know, additional JMX exporters like you would in Kafka. And what this means is you, know, you get gr greatly simplified infrastructure rather than um, Kafka, which as you know, especially when you start adding in these other components, it gets pretty complex. We're also a lot more performant than Kafka. So, um, one of the biggest things is being able to run a lot of throughput with a small amount of brokers. So for example, um, we have one customer that is running, a, they're bursting at about 15 gigabytes a second, and they're doing that on nine nodes of Red Panda. So that's actually a good example of um, instances that are available in the cloud now with larger uh, amounts of resources, right? So they actually have like pretty beefy machines, but we're able to take full advantage and saturate all of the resources um, immediately on, on those machines. And we do that by using our, our CSTAR framework. Um, and then we also end up having like faster uh, latency times. So like, uh, our tail latencies are predictably much lower. You can see it here from a benchmarking output. We have a number of different benchmarking blogs. You may have seen them out there, but uh, happy to share those if you're interested. Um, if you go to redpanda.com slash blog, you'll see stuff uh, very quickly. And um, this opens us up for more use cases beyond just like analytics type use cases where the data eventually lands. So if you want to be able to use a Kafka API for event-driven architecture, uh, you want to be able to, to do um, operational use cases, we have customers that are uh, using Red Panda instead of like their previous RabbitMQ system, for example, for like order management systems and the trading platform. Um, us being able to have better durability and persistence and all that while maintaining that low latency opens up um, a lot of avenues for you. So we can scale really well vertically as well as horizontally. We can have tons of different uh, brokers in your cluster if you want. Um, and then even just a simple three node Red Panda cluster or a single node, um, if you don't care about the resiliency um, or you're at the edge or something and you just want a single node, we can handle like a gigabyte a second with the smallest cluster, right? So that sets you up for if, you know, you only have like one meg or, um, 10, 10 megs a second ingress today, but you think you might 10x because uh, your, your data demands are growing very quickly. You don't have to think about scaling your Red Panda cluster for quite a while. And then we also run on ARM. So we do very well on the ARM platform, uh, ARM architecture. And uh, like an example is the IS4 gen models on AWS, 
uh, we run super fast on those and you don't need as much resources. We also have something called tiered storage. Um, and you may be aware of what tiered storage does in Kafka. It helps you offload your data to object storage that's cheaper and more infinitely available um, to, to essentially offload your log segments, right? And you, you then can seamlessly uh, consume those messages without having to specify that your data is actually coming from an object storage platform. We'll just pass those through, right? Um, the overarching technology that we created to do this is called shadow indexing. And the reason why we call it that is because we store a shadow copy of all of your log segments to tiered storage, to, to object storage. Um, and then you can actually manage those retentions separately. So uh, as your data, as your log segments are rolling, we, 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 we offload a copy, right? And you can specify your roll period on those. So for example, if you only want um, 50 megabyte log segments, uh, you know, small, small log segments to be stored individually in S3 buckets, um, that is uh, your choice, or you could choose to have much larger log segments. And that just gives you the ability to, um, you know, leverage, like turn, turn knobs for performance uh, versus RPO. And I'll talk about RPO in a second as well. But um, the indexing part is the indexing part of shadow indexing is where we index the log segments in memory and then externalize into manifest files that live with the log segments themselves. So what that, um, what that means is that you now can leverage those log segments, those shadow copies of log segments for other cluster purposes. So an example of that um, is remote read replicas. So since we already have stored the log segments off onto uh, object storage, you can now spin up a, a new cluster that has just a few nodes. Uh, maybe you know, they're, they're a very low amount of resources because you don't need much storage at all. It just passes through read requests um, from object storage. So um, if you have like additional fan out needs, like let's say you wanna go beyond 3X or 5X fan out um, and you don't wanna impact your operational cluster, this is a great use case because then you're not touching the operational cluster at all. Another example use case for that would be if you want to um, do like a um, data syndication use case where you have a cluster with a with ACLs that are completely different from, you know, your operational cluster ACLs. Uh, that's actually a really, really common uh, use case for people because, you know, they might, might want to put it into an area that uh, has other people access, like in a DMZ or something. And you just, you just don't want to expose your operational cluster. So you can have as many of those as you want. It's a really handy feature. And then another thing that you can use these shadow indexing based log segments for is um, in a worst case scenario where you have like a disaster, um, you're, you can't access your cluster anymore. Uh, you actually have a copy of these log segments there, right? So um, the only thing that, so then what you can do actually is stand up a new cluster, point to those log segments and we call it remote recovery. Uh, you can start producing into and consuming out of that cluster immediately as soon as it becomes available, uh, rather than waiting for that data to completely rehydrate into the cluster. So it's, it's a couple of really great features that you get from tiered storage above and beyond just being able to alleviate your local disk uh, to accommodate those high throughput workloads. And uh, this, by the way, is one of our enterprise features. We have just a couple of features that are enterprise, continuous data balancing, and, uh, and this tiered storage, this shadow indexing feature. So what it ends up meaning is, you know, we end up costing a lot less than Kafka. Typically, it's very common for us to save our, our customers, our users, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, we have uh, someone who is, it's a hedge fund out in Silicon Valley they had 380 brokers of Apache Kafka. So quite a large footprint that they have to manage. Um, they're running about three and a half gigabytes per second. 
and we've taken them down to about 22 nodes of Red Panda um, to accommodate uh, that, that average throughput of 3.5 gigabytes a second. And that was just their choice on how they wanted to deploy it um, within the different availability zones and so some of their other uh, mission critical kind of resilience demands. Okay, so let's get into how you deploy Red Panda, um, some, of the, some of the meat of this presentation here. Uh, so Red Panda stands up very quickly. Um, we have uh, Red Panda Cloud, of course. So we have two different flavors of our cloud. One of them is called Dedicated. The other is called uh, Bring Your Own Cloud. And Dedicated is where it lives in our VPC. Um, BYOC is where, it li where the data plane lives in uh, your VPC, your account, while the control plane lives in ours. So similar to like a Databricks model. And then we have a uh, self-hosted, right? And I'm going to get into some of these different ways that you can start up Red Panda very quickly in a self-hosted self basis. And by the way, Red Panda is free. We do have an enterprise version uh, where you can become a customer, but we do like to uh, promote the fact that, that we are free. It's a business source license, business source available. So um, you can look at our source code. You could compile it if you really needed to, uh, but it's free for you to run. Okay, so getting into Red Panda Cloud, um, super simple. You just have to create. So once you have an org, uh, and I'll, I invite you to ask for a cloud trial, um, you'll see that you just have a blank slate, right? And you can create then a namespace. That's like what environment it would be. You can think of it that way. Uh, and then you just like say you want to create a cluster. You choose which cloud you want to be on, what your region, availability zone, um, and your networking option. And it does take you know a little while for that cluster to stand up, whether it's dedicated or BYOC, because we're actually provisioning um, an EKS or a GKE cluster for you. By the way, you didn't hear me mention Azure. Um, we're still working on Azure, and we expect that to be later this year. But we do run in AKS, by the way. Uh, we have customers in AKS today. And I thought I would show you a little bit of what our cloud actually looks like. So here is my namespace, Larson. Um, and you can just create a cluster here. We do have serverless coming soon, which is will, will be our multi-tenant option. Uh, then if you want to create like a dedicated cluster, it, com it comes up with this little screen here. Uh, you know, give it a name. And uh, specify your throughput. This is something that's going to be going away pretty soon. It was just, uh, you know, it, it, it's what we have uh, today. You can go beyond 20 megabytes a second. Uh, I know that that is kind of confusing right here. I'm not the hugest fan of it. But um, you can actually specify your Red Panda version, version in case you need to be on an earlier version, for example. Uh, and then you choose your cloud, right? And then you get your your regions in here, whether you want single or multi. Multi-AZ with a Kafka environment is, is significantly more expensive. Um, and then, you know, one thing that I really like here is that you can actually choose the AZ that you want. That's not the case with some, some of our competitors. Um, it is really handy because then, you know, you can minimize your cross-AZ charges and that becomes particularly helpful when you're in a BYOC type environment. Um, and, then, and then you just choose like your networking. Do you want public or private? So with private today, we support um, you can you, we support uh, VPC peering, and we're going to have private link uh, soon. So be looking out for that. Uh, and the cider, you can go up to a slash twenty one for the cider if you're doing VPC peering, and then you just do create, and it'll start spinning up that cluster for you and give you some uh, details on how to connect to that. Um, and then, you know, BYOC is almost identical, except after you do create, you will end up seeing like an RPK command. It's our CLI to spin up the, uh, it, it's basically terraforming the cluster on your side. And then when it's done, there's an agent, the agent spins up the BYOC cluster. Uh, it's a very small uh, T3 micro in AWS, for example. And then we have a similar instance type in, in GCP. And that actually is what creates your cluster and tells our control plane the status of everything. Uh, and then it's almost identical in terms of how you will access that cluster um, when you go into Red Panda Cloud on the front end. OK, so that's cloud. OK, so then uh, running Red Panda on your laptop. 
we have a really great quick start where you can actually just run RPK container start. So if you just download and install RPK on your laptop, um, it stands for Red Panda Keeper. It's our CLI. You can do tons of stuff with that CLI. Uh, and one of them is just RPK container start. It starts up a local Docker, right? Or you can use Docker Run. Um, you can use Docker Compose, obviously. We have examples here on, uh, on our quick start for like one node versus uh, three nodes uh, of Red Panda. Super easy. Um, and I have a, a sample Docker Compose that stands up a bunch of different things, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, and, and I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, there's actually this, if you go, uh, I believe in here, Docker Compose samples, there is, oh, here we go. Yeah, Owl Shop sample application. So this has like Red Panda console. It has Red Panda itself, um, connectors. We have a, we, we support Kafka Connect. So we have like a Docker image with a whole bunch of the connectors that we support. And this actually starts uh, generating data into your cluster as well, which is super handy. Yeah, and then we have like Red Panda Console. I welcome you to run Red Panda Console if you already have Kafka running. Um, it used to be called Cowl, K-Owl. Um, and uh, we've encountered a lot of people who were running like KOL against MSK, for example. So now they want uh, Red Panda Console, uh, you know, a license specifically of Red Panda Console for their MSK, which we're looking at providing. Um, we don't do that today. Currently, it's just a free product that um, you can use, uh, but you just wouldn't get support for it if you don't have Red Panda. Um, and then uh, we do have Docker images for connectors. <clears throat> We do run really well in Kubernetes because we're single binary, right? So if you want to have a uh, schema registry, HTTP proxy, and Red Panda itself, you'll just see three pods because we don't need additional pods for these additional components, right? And it's a small image. So um, we stand up super fast in that. We have Helm charts, and uh, they'll just run in any Kubernetes uh, actually beyond, I believe, let's just see here version 1.20. So any Kubernetes that is uh, greater than or equal to 1.20, you're good, right? So um, yeah, and we also have an operator and the operator knows how to speak Red Panda really well to be able to do rolling upgrades and such, but we have built that into Helm charts as well. So, you know, it just kind of depends if you prefer to use operator versus uh, Helm charts, that's, that's kind of up to you, but kind of getting ahead of myself here. Uh, I've, I'm going to talk about Kubernetes in a minute. So let's go ahead and look at console. So I, right before this, I stood up the Docker Compose for a single node Red Panda. You can see that that's running. Um, you can see that we have like schema registry enabled and Kafka Connect um, and what version it is. This talks to our admin API. Then you can see like what topics are in here, right? So you can, by default, you see your, your hidden topics here, which I personally uh, I personally like, but you can also remove that. Um, and then like, if you wanted to go into any one of these, these topics, you can see very clearly what's going on in here. So we automatically deserialize many different formats and depict in JSON which is just so awesome for like a getting started in a day uh, developer experience. It's so common that people send in like protobuf or Avro or message pack or so one of these formats that's more of a binary type format. Um, and then, you know, it's hard to read it in here. So then you would typically want to use schema registry, which schema registry does work in here. If you, if you have produced the messages using schema registry and you have your magic byte in the front of the message, we'll pick that up and use the schema registry to know how to deserialize it based on your compatibility modes. However, if you have Avro sent in that includes the schema, we will automatically deserialize that. And if you set the protodef files um, in your configuration file, like a, a, a GitHub or a directory on where to find those, those definitions, um, we'll actually deserialize the protobuf and depict it in this way as well. So it's just really handy to be able to actually paginate through your results, um, see your most recent results. You can actually see that uh, looking at the time here, it, it is you know continuously pumping in messages. Um, 
And then another thing that you can see here as well is like this uh, uh, filter. So, you know, we can turn off the filter um, and refresh uh, or turn on the filter. And this gives you a JavaScript based way of doing filtering. So for example, if I wanted to come in here and um, filter by type invoice, right? Cause I see that as something in my, in my payload. Um, I can actually just do this. I already have one in there actually. Um, so let's just use customer type. I kind of like that one because it's actually, uh, it, it's actually nested, right? So um, your parameters are in here and you have these default parameters. So these are obviously the portions of a Kafka message, right? So you always have offset partition that it lives in the key, the value and the headers. So you can actually use any one of these to do your filtering on. Um, and this is just JavaScript, uh, it supports TypeScript. Um, you know, it's very, very simple scripting here. So you can just see in the dot notation, value.customer.type equals personal. And by doing that, we know that if we, if we do a refresh here, it's only going to be personal. So this can be super handy for people who want to be able to like figure out exactly what the messages look like. Did I get these messages produced as I expected? What's the message count of those that have this particular, um, you know, uh, uh, value in the payload? So that's probably my favorite part of, uh, of Red Panda Console right there. And it actually does a, a push down to the server side. So this isn't like, um, you know, client side JavaScript that you're running in your browser, it's actually running it on the server. So you can, you can scale your resources appropriately for that. Another big thing is uh, consumer lag. And unfortunately, I just don't have any consumers hooked up here. I should have done that. Um, but consumer lag is one of the most important things you can be looking at. And uh, we have that in here, obviously. Um, the particular partitions. And if you have uh, uh, many different brokers, this is a great way of seeing like how your leadership is aligned across the brokers. Right, and you can see where these replicas actually live. So it gives you a sense of like, you know, the skew that might be present um, within each partition and across the different brokers. It's also really helpful. We have something called rack awareness that allows you to, uh, you know, this is obviously for more when you go to when you when you go to get into production or you look to get into production, um, you might want to consider using rack awareness. Because if you have like multiple regions or multiple availability zones, you can have um, you can be sure that through anti-affinity rules, you have leaders that live um, in a distributed way across your your um, availability zones, right? So so you don't get overloaded in one. Um, but this way, you can kind of verify that the underline on the broker number will tell you where the leader is. So it just makes it really easy for you to see the distribution there. And then you see some different configurations, which you can actually modify as well. By the way, Red Panda is a completely Kafka admin API uh, or admin client API compatible as well. Um, so a lot of these like, you know, Kafka ACLs or, you know, Kafka topics and all those like uh, binaries that are used in the Apache Kafka uh, project are, are usable in Red Panda. And then we also have ACLs, right? So you can actually like uh, create ACLs in here. You can look at your existing ACLs and all that fun stuff. Um, we also have this feature of documentation, which can be really handy. Again, not really best for the day one, but like um, uh, documentation is a GitHub based. So if you wanna do a readme with your markdown in there, you can just point to where the documentation for this topic actually lives. Um, you do that in the configuration file for Red Panda Console. And that way, if, if I did enable this, uh, we'd be able to click on it and just see the markdown of, of all the docs for this particular topic. Um, you know, schema registry, obviously. Uh, this is another view of the, the consumer groups, which gets into more detail. Um, this is actually how you can create your user and create ACLs. So if I just want to um, specify a particular user, uh, that user was created and we can now, uh, you know, start creating some ACLs based on it, right? So we might have to do uh, ASDF and we'll do it for all hosts. And then let's just do all operations or be able to specify all these. Again, 
not necessarily a uh, day one type thing that you would do, but might be helpful if you do stand up a, uh, a development cluster. And then I really like being able to just manage connectors here within Red Panda console. We have a bunch that are pre-built, pre-loaded or pre-rolled in our image. Um, so, so these are some of them here. You, you see some uh, mirror stuff. We do support uh, Mirror Maker 2. We find it's been really, really great uh, to actually migrate you know, clusters from Kafka to Red Panda or one Red Panda cluster to another Red Panda cluster. It does really good offset translation, we found. Um, and we, we use it a lot, actually, in production for some of our cloud customers who are moving uh, to, to different cloud clusters, for example. But yeah, I mean, the, the experience here is really good, and I welcome you to, to try it out. Connectors is obviously an important part of the ecosystem. I hope this was helpful. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, we have, you know, Kubernetes. Uh, we have like uh, Helm charts for it. I personally am of I'm more of a fan of the Helm charts because you just have a single values.yaml where you can uh, modify, you know, manage anything you want in there. Like it has the kitchen sink of all the possible commands, and it just makes it really um, self-documenting, uh, really easy to use. We use the operator for our um, cloud environments, uh, cloud clusters, and we are in the process of re-releasing our operator for um, the community. So watch the space. We're going to be uh, getting that out in the next couple of months. And uh, these are the formally supported Kubernetes, just because we like have, you know, hardcore like active testing on them. Uh, but we have found that it just works, right, um, functionally in these other Kubernetes versions like OpenShift and Rancher and all those, you know, it, it just works. And then Red Panda does run really well on virtual machines or bare metal type context. Um, if you want to have like really low latency, like produces in the microseconds, so like sub millisecond produces, I have seen that on bare metal. Um, we do have an optimized write path. We work really well on local SSDs. So that's kind of similar actually to how you want to think about your instance types when you do uh, deploy Red Panda. So um, the instance types with local storage and AWS, for example, just, just giving you examples here, would be like, the, as I mentioned, the IS4 gen for ARM. Uh, or the IM for Gen, uh, or the I3EN, uh, or I4I. Uh, and then the, the metal instances are also good in AWS. So we just, I mean, can you use EBS? Yes, um, it works, but you start running into some restrictions. And that's where, you know, you like you hit quota limits on IOPS, for example. Uh, it just becomes important if you, if you want the lowest latency possible like sustained IOPS, they'll give you a certain amount. And then once you go beyond that, you start having um, some, some, some limits being imposed on you. So I do you know, highly recommend that you then uh, use those local instance types, format as XFS, run Red Panda Tuner, uh, and essentially um, you know, be using local storage because we are all about IOPS. One thing that I didn't mention actually is that we will F-sync on every write. So it's awesome. We made that decision deliberately um, because we know that SSDs are just getting faster and faster and um, Raft is particularly well suited. So we use Raft for replication, right? And it's particularly well suited for doing an F-sync to disk on those replication um, processes. So when you ask for an ACK back, um, we're actually writing to disk before we give you the ACK. So if you want low latency, you just want as many IOPS available to you as possible. So in that regard, we do run better on bare metal. We do run faster um, when we have isolated resources that you can count on that are not being shared and you'll have no noisy neighbor effect, right? Um, so just something to consider if you do want it to blaze. Um, from an automation perspective, uh, since this is a, a, a getting started in the day, um, we have Ansible playbooks. So um, that works really, really well 
uh, and you actually get the red panda cluster. Um, you get the monitoring pre-configured and automatically scraping into a Prometheus that we deploy and Grafana that we deploy and it's importing a Grafana dashboard, um, as well as pre-configured clients as like three different groups um, in your host Sinai. So it is uh, really fast and easy actually to deploy Red Panda in Ansible. So if you go to like our uh, GitHub deployment automation, we have them chained together. So you would have like your um, Terraform to Terraform your, your you know, infrastructure for it. And then on top of that, we then do the Ansible. And then um, I did want to just like call out that, uh, you know, we, all, of course, now we have things embedded in the single binary, like schema register, HTTP proxy and Prometheus uh, scraping. But soon we will have a Wasm runtime running in the engine. So like we had a sidecar, you might, you may know this if, if you've been following Red Panda, um, we had Wasm for the last uh, approximately six, eight months. And that's in, that was in preview mode. We recently took it out of preview. Um, that was a sidecar of the V8 engine. Uh, V8 engine is single threaded. You know, it's not particularly performant when you have like high throughput, right? Um, so these, these transformations that you would do in the broker itself were just kind of not uh, performant enough in V8. So uh, we decided to re-implement a Wasm runtime in C++ directly in the engine. Uh, we've made really good progress on that. So watch out for that coming soon. I think that's probably one of the most exciting things that, that we have coming. Um, and that just means that you'd be able to write your transformations uh, your stream processing in any language you want that compiles to WebAssembly. So uh, the way it works is you essentially have a, an RPK command to do an RPK generate WASM, which will generate a scaffolding that has some pre-built um, code in there for you to just have an input topic and then an output topic, an example for you to use. Uh, modify it as you want, and then you would do RPK Wasm compile, it compiles into WebAssembly, and then RPK Wasm deploy, and that just deploys it into the entire cluster. So those Wasms, uh, they actually are running uh, local to the data itself. So they're all working with a local copy of the data that's available. Um, it'll be exactly once capable, and you'll be able to do all sorts of different use cases in it. So we're super excited about that. And then another one that we're going to be doing soon uh, is we are, we've made the decision to put the log segments on object storage externalized as iceberg instead of like a binary log segment format that you can't really query. So whenever people would be hearing uh, indexing, right? They're like, does that mean I can actually query the log segments? Well, soon you'll be able to. So, um, Obviously, very exciting on that too. Do I see it being used as um, your source of truth data lake? Um, maybe not. It's probably more of just a source to be able to do additional ETL sourcing from. Um, but you know, you know your use case is best, and and you might find that you're able to do that actually. So. And then some of the part two of the uh, day one. Um, so the second half of the day. Monitoring uh, is obviously one of them. And um, I've, I've gone into some pretty good detail here. We have uh, these RPK commands to generate a Prometheus config. So it'll automatically use your advertised listeners. For example, those familiar with Kafka know about advertised listeners, how you have like different IP addresses uh, for internal use versus external use, it's particularly important um, in like AWS with public IPs and stuff like that, right? Uh, and then you can also uh, generate a dashboard and it'll just like automatically um, be given, you know, give you like all the right um, charts and everything that, that know how to query Prometheus. We have six additional dashboards in GitHub, which feel free to reach out. Um, I can provide those to you. We have, th so those generally, the main dashboards that we have are primarily used against uh, a Prometheus endpoint that we have called public metrics. 
So public metrics are more rolled up. Um, they're, they're higher grain. So it saves you some money on your Grafana, for example. Um, but then we also have this other metrics endpoints called slash metrics. And that's more of like the, the nitty gritty, the, the uh, low grain, the fine grain uh, that's like very quickly updating. And you, if you're trying to troubleshoot performance issues, for example, uh, a lot of times they're, they're at the lower levels, right? So we call it the kitchen sink dashboard and it gives you like really, really low, low, low level IO kind of metrics from all of your different resources, for example. And then we have a node exporter, which gives you, you know, your typical like, you know, memory, CPU, all that kind of stuff from the, the actual node that you're running on from an infrastructure perspective. So um, Red Panda Console is deployed using either Docker image or uh, DB in your own packages. Um, and I invite you to do that and play around with our message filtering that you saw. And then we do have a Red Panda tuner. So in order to run the Red Panda tuner, you have to set, uh, we have two different modes. One of them is called development and one of them is called production. And it's run through an RPK command. So you set that hint in your cluster to be running in production. And then that gives you the ability to do uh, Red Panda tuner. So Red Panda Tuner actually tunes like a bunch of different kernel parameters that make Red Panda run faster. So like in Kubernetes, that would run on the individual nodes in your node group. So you'd want to be able to either have it as a post install script in your Terraform or be able to, you know, SSH into it essentially, right? And, and just like run the RPK uh, Red Panda Tune All command on the node itself. And then we also have another one called IOTune, which is essentially like FIO. Um, as I mentioned, we're really IOPS dependent. So you really do want to find out like what your available IOPS are. So IOTune will run for about 10, 15 minutes so that it's a sustained load, right? And then it'll give you like what the effective read and write IOPS are available to you. And then it'll um, provide hints for run, running Red Panda a little bit better in that context. So we're just trying to make Red Panda, you know, event, event streaming or data streaming um, so much easier from, you know, a tuning perspective as well as like a self-healing perspective. We didn't talk too much about uh, continuous data balancing, but we really want to make it so that you can essentially start up Red Panda in um, a couple of minutes with Kubernetes, for example, and uh, be producing significant throughputs with low latencies. And uh, we invite you to do that. I've talked about RPK, Red Panda, Keeper, uh, and there are a number of different operations that you can do with it. So um, RPK Container Start is one of them. And you can do a lot of great things like managing topics, right? So if you just want to be able to uh, create, delete, alter topics, or you want to produce, consume into or from topics, super quick, easy way to do that. If you do a dash V, um, it's, it puts you in verbose mode. So you can actually see the various things that are happening. Really, it's really helpful for, for troubleshooting. Like if you forgot to set advertised listeners and you're getting some vague error in producing to your topic or creating a topic, you can then run a dash V and you'll see that like, because of the bootstrap command, the metadata request that you get back, um, it's actually telling you to communicate with an internal IP to the Kubernetes cluster that you can't access from outside. You'd be able to see that through verbose mode. So just get used to running um, RPK in general. Um, RPK cluster config, you can do an inline config edit to see like what all of your different configurations are in the entire cluster. And then like um, if you want to use like Emacs or VI, uh, you then make your configurations right there in line, you save, and it'll actually do a version controlled config update in your cluster. Um, and you can do like a config, cluster config get for a key, and it'll give you the value of that key in the configuration. And you can do an individual set as well, which can make um, you know, GitOps a lot easier. Um, and then uh, obviously you can do ACLs through that and you can also do it through binaries, uh, like the typical Apache Kafka binaries. You can look at consumer lag, detail, right? So if you wanna just look at all of your different consumers, consumer groups, 
um, you know, what the lag is for each one of them, all that kind of stuff is really helpful. And then I really love the fact that we have this debug bundle. So it's another RPK command that, that generates a bundle, a zip file or, or a tarball of all of your um, log files that are pertinent. It'll give us your configs. Um, it'll say, it'll do like a top output to find out, you know, how, how your nodes are looking um, individually. And that can just be sent along to Red Panda. So if you wanted to join like our Red Panda community and you had any sort of issues on your cluster, um, you can reach out to me on there, for example. And um, if you send me a debug bundle, I'll go ahead and look at it and help you out. So we just really want to try to, you know, make sure that you're a happy camper using Red Panda as easy as possible. And then one of the cool things with RPK actually is plugins. So um, RPK is written in Go. We're a big Go shop. Uh, we actually have Franz Go under our engineering umbrella. So it's a really, really good um, Go client. I highly recommend it for a number of reasons. But um, because we're such a big Go shop, we have this plugin framework. So an example of that is this like edge forwarder. So one thing I haven't talked about too much is that Red Panda runs really well on low resources, like ARM, for example, but it could be other stuff um, running at the edge, right? So, so one of these plugins is like an edge forwarder that allows you to forward from an edge cluster to a mothership cluster, for example. And someone wrote that as a plugin and put it on GitHub. All right. So that's it. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, just like maybe we can just ask time to one question Christian asked. It's like, oh, if you, we can just have like one minute to answer that question. What is the overall best memory speed usage of the stack? It, it depends. So you can have like with a, uh, so, so the bare minimum is the question around bare minimum. So I'll just tell you, bare, bare minimum, you would want like, uh, I believe it's 500 megabytes of memory and we need at least one CPU. So we're a thread per core architecture. So we like to have at least one, um, core, logical core associated. And, you know, one thing that's kind of funky that you may be asking is what does the resource utilization look like when you're running Red Panda? So if you just do a top, um, you'll actually see that Red Panda is consuming like 100%, or it's actually like 90 something percent of your resources, even if you're not doing much. And the reason why is because we use the C-Star framework, which, um, grabs all of the CPU available and then starts allocating threads for those cores. So if you really want to see the actual resource utilization, you want to be looking at our um, Prometheus metrics, which give you like a, a, what we call reactor utilization of the actual CPU that's really being used. So hopefully that helps. But we'll, you, we'll saturate as much as you give us and you can be declarative about how much to actually give. So you can say, I only want Red Pan on this one VM, for example, I want that node to use, um, you know, eight gigs of RAM out of the 64 that you have and um, 16 CPUs out of the 128 CPUs that you have so that you could co-locate workloads in that way if you want. And we will not be a noisy neighbor. Thanks a lot. <laughs>